This episode of Cell and Gene, the podcast, is brought to you in partnership with Thermo Fisher Scientific and Applied Biosystems' new Qualtrack real-time PCR and digital PCR solutions for biopharma. Give your cell and gene therapy development an edge with reliable and accurate qPCR and dPCR workflows backed by a trusted supplier. Explore the complete ecosystem of CGMP-compliant qPCR and dPCR assays master mixes and instruments at thermofisher.com slash qpcr slash biopharma. Welcome to this episode of Cell and Gene, the podcast. I'm your host, Aaron Harris, and my guest for this episode is Chris Fox, president of Novartis Gene Therapies. Novartis Gene Therapies until 2020, known as Avexis, is a biotech company that develops treatments for rare neurological genetic disorders. So Chris, thank you for being here. It's so great to have you on the podcast. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. All right. First up, bring us up to speed on Novartis Gene Therapies. What are you and the company focused on in the back half of 2022? Yeah, it's, uh, there are so many things. It's hard to like narrow it down as I'm sure everyone can appreciate, but, you know, I'd say squarely, we've been very vigilant about continuing to advance, um, newborn screening, which obviously is the gateway for diagnosis for us. And then once diagnosed, you know, one of our goals, uh, for the benefit of the patient is to shorten that time from diagnosis to treatment, incredibly critical. Um, and last, I think this is a more macro thing, um, but really continuing to forge access because obviously once you identify the patient and you know where they are and you know what treats, treatments they could potentially go on, having access so that they can get it is really, really important. And that's a, you know, a long, long process. So we're really kind of focused on those main areas for commercialization and continued commercialization. Good, good. Okay. Uh, for our listeners who I'm sure perhaps most, if not all know this, but just in case. Yeah. Uh, Explain the relationship between Novartis and Novartis Gene Therapies. Yeah, it's one we get often, right? Because I think there's so much fluidity in this space that it's important to kind of keep track of the lineage. But Novartis, as most people probably know, is a global healthcare company based in Switzerland um, with the mission of kind of reimagining medicines, both for um, you know extending people's lives, but but also just improving their quality of life. Um, Novartis Gene Therapies is, is nested under that. So we're a separate division. We're located where I'm talking to you from, Chicago. Um, and we're a part of, of the greater company, you know, really focused on gene therapies and more broadly rare genetic diseases. And, you know, just as a, I guess, um, plug for, you know, relationships of this sort, it's really, really been very productive. And I say that because I'm relatively new to the team coming up on my year anniversary and um, you know, the great thing about the outcome of this, right, is we, we got all the expertise from Novartis um, and the global footprint, which is really, really crucial for a disease state like ours. And we brought to it, you know, agility and speed to decision making. Um, and so it's been a really, really wonderful collaborative marriage. And we're both sides are learning, but I think we're advancing it at large. So it's been really good. Good. Yeah. Thank you. And, and we would, I would agree, certainly. But uh, thank you for the the explanation of how the two are working together. Um, I'm glad you also brought up that you're going to be celebrating your one year anniversary as president, because that's what I want to talk about next. Okay. So, later this year, like you said, you'll be celebrating your one year as president of Novartis Gene Therapies. And you've led teams at companies such as Amgen, Takeda, Merck, others. So, you know, even based on your learnings from those companies, what you've you're bringing to your role at Novartis Gene Therapies as president. What would you say are your, your top near-term priorities for the company in the next even, say, two to three years? Yeah. So I love that time horizon because I think we have been spending a great deal of time kind of chunking that down. So Jensen has been wildly successful, but our work is not done yet in IV. So we need to continue to advance that. That's, you know, squarely part of where we're focused in the short term and, and midterm. And then kind of our second generation will be our intrathecal um, formulation, which is really going to be targeted against um, unmet needs of those older uh, patients, SMA patients that, you know, um, could really benefit from a one-time treatment. So we're very squarely focused on that. Um, and then I'd say too, taking the capabilities that we've built, which, you know, well before I was ever here, um, the team has done an extraordinary job of 
Now, how can we apply those same capabilities either to other Novartis assets or external acquisitions? Um, really, really important, you know, for our future. And then lastly, and this has been a big part of my journey, quite frankly, is advancing the culture. Um, it's a really wonderful culture, really, really smart people, very capable, um, you know, very focused on advancing um, our success. But I think also a big part of that is how do we create a climate where people still see it that way? And they went from a very small company to now being a part of a bigger company. How can they, you know, live out both their professional and personal aspirations within Novartis GTX? So it's something that I think we have to, you know, that feeds all of those other kind of accomplishments. If, we, if we're focused on those, we have to have a great culture. A hundred percent. I couldn't agree more uh, about the company culture aspect of it, for sure. Um, so that's what you're saying that success looks like in your role. So really advancing the company culture and making sure that that drives everything else from underneath of what Novartis is going to, Novartis is going to be working on this year. Yep. Okay. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the R&D. Uh, sure. And Novartis Gene Therapy, their R&D uh, currently part of it, currently focuses on AAV-based therapies and CRISPR-based technologies. Mm -hmm. So talk to us about what's in development for both AAV and CRISPR-based technologies that we cover that more and more extensively on Cell and Gene and our listeners just kind of can't get enough of it. So talk <laughs> to us about what you're working on. Yeah. So what I can share, and, and actually this is one of those things that's a phenomenon of being part of a bigger company, right? Um, Novartis has a group called NIVR, which stands for Novartis Institutes of Biomedical Research. And it's one of the cornerstones, quite frankly, of, of our success. Um, so for us specifically, we have about 20 um, programs in, in flight that are gene therapy and, you know, really focused on transformative therapies, um, wide range of conditions, you know, as you articulated, but mainly in rare disease of those of those 20 plus. Um, and a big part of this role, quite frankly, is collaborating with them, is to making sure that the science, you know, is fantastic, continues to be fantastic. That's squarely in their shop. Ours is to make sure that it's commercially viable. And what I like about this is it's not only for what we have in the hopper here, but it's also as we look at other assets or acquisitions too, we really collaborate very heavily on, on this. So it's a source of strength for us. And I think we'll continue to be in them really, really excited because it's a, it's a wonderful um, opportunity. Good, good. Uh, I want you, I knew Zil Jensma, or, um, Jill, excuse me, Zil Jensma earlier. And uh, I want to talk a little bit more about that. So you, like you said, you have 20 plus gene therapy targets in your pipeline mm -hmm. and your initial gene therapy. So Zil Jensma, mm -hmm. I'm sure all of our listeners know, uh, or <laughs> SMA. Uh, has been approved in more than 40 regions and countries and has been used to treat more than 2,300 patients worldwide. Uh, what's next for that therapy, even on a commercialization front? Like, where are we going? Yeah, so it's um, it's a great question. And I'd say, you know, while we've had a lot of success, we're not done yet. Um, we still have to advance newborn screening um, as, as the gateway to understand and help support these patients. You know, it's very, very advanced in the United States, but we're trying to be much, much more global. So we have a lot more work to do to set up that infrastructure. Um, the other thing, as I mentioned before, is, is value and access is such a big, important component of this. Um, to bring it to market, you know, we have to have kind of bespoke value agreements. And, and that's easy to say, hard to execute because, um, you know, every health ministry has its own set of standards and its own way of looking at this. And so we're trying to be really, really flexible um, and, and continue to advance kind of our, our global footprint. And that really is the, the last bit that we're focused on is how can we reach far reaching places that we never even thought were possible? Um, you know, access in Brazil and Chile and Ecuador and, you know, all parts of, of the Middle East. It's It's been an extraordinary journey. Um, and one, quite frankly, that, you know, we haven't mastered yet. We're learning as we go. Um, so it's it's all kind of a work in progress. And the good news is we continue to build on the, su the successes that we have, and we're learning from it as we go. Sure, sure. Uh, I still want to dig a little bit deeper into commercialization. So okay, when it comes to product commercialization, so you as president, talk to us about your biggest challenges that you and your team face. Yeah, it's a, you know, you look at newborn screening, for instance, it seemed from afar very, very easy to get that, you know, set up in the U.S. and we're at, you know, 90 plus percent. Um, 
newborn screen of, of, of babies, but it's incredibly hard when you look at across the globe um, infrastructure and desire, right? There's a panel that exists and, and um, SMA isn't always on it or very rarely on it. And so it's kind of developing that need and, you know, seeking to understand. So I think that certainly is one of them. Um, you know, the value and access or, uh, agreements that I mentioned just a couple minutes ago, also really difficult, um, you know, both from getting kind of a Novartis tolerance to look at new different ways of thinking about it, but then also finding out how do we need and, and um, you know, advance access. Um, the other thing that I'd say is, is also kind of a culture thing that, you know, we continue to face is how do we keep people engaged and, and ready to do what's next, right? Because now we're in the hard part of um, taking that and translating all of the success we've had in, in kind of micro um, climates. And so a big part of that is, is how do we organize for the future and make sure that we're ready for what we can't see around the corner, whether it be a next, the next therapy or, you know, our next task as a team. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, for our listeners, now before our call, you and I are talking about Blue Cell and Dean's audiences, and, and part of that audience are small and working biotechs. And I'd love to know from your perspective, what advice do you have for our listeners who are, well, I mean, about small and emerging biotech, everyone from small and emerging biotech to scientists and academics, but who are on the path to commercialization, what would you, what, what pearls of wisdom would you offer them <laughs> as they, as they approach, you know, with, with commercialization and um, yeah. as the goal? Well, so, you know, I have benefited, I think across my career, not just since I've been at GTX um, from lots of great advice. And so I think, two things sit with me that as I think about your question is, um, but they both resound around one thing and that's listening. So I think in this space particularly, it's really, really important to listen to the patients to understand the journey that they're on. And you can do that through advocacy organizations as well, which is incredibly important um, in the rare space. That being said, you know, one of the learnings I've had over time is if we're not listening very carefully, you can kind of be solving some things that aren't really their biggest problem. Um, and so putting our effort and, you know, um, our thought process and quite frankly, our effort um, is going to be really important to, to listen very clearly. And I'd say it's just as important internally. So, you know, kind of up and out listening, but then also down and in listening to your team and to your associates. Um, I think I've been a part of a lot of really, really high performing teams. And one thing's for sure is, you know, in general, there's going to be lots of people sitting around your table that know a lot more than you do and making sure that you kind of entertain all of those ideas. Um, and it's not to mean that you're going to be able to do them all, but I think it helps me parse out what's most important, what's really urgent, um, what obstacles need to be removed. And um, not that it's easier, that it's a straight line always, but I wouldn't otherwise know that. So I think listening on both sides, you know, outside your company and inside, really, really important, um, at least in the experiences I've had. Sure, absolutely. Uh, and listening internally and externally, and also just a better collaboration all around. So, yes, makes sense. Um, I'm so glad you brought up patient advocacy groups and therefore patient engagement because on episode nine of Selling Being the Podcast, I had the pleasure of talking to your colleague, Amy Nicole, mm -hmm. uh, and we talked all about what patient engagement should encompass and what it should look like. Uh, in the cell and gene field. And it was a terrific episode. I encourage all of our listeners to go back and listen to that one too. Um, yeah. But for now, uh, as, as president, you know, do you meet with patients and their families in any capacity? And, you know, if so, or even if not, you know, just explain what you and your team learned from that patient interaction and the collaboration that comes with it. Yeah. Emphatically, I, I meet with them and I relish it. I think it is this role versus others I've had is how intimate and close we are with the patient journey and their experiences. And I meet families all the time. And I say families because we meet the patient, but oftentimes they're really little. Um, and so you kind of get the experiences through the parents. And as a mom of three, I universally put myself in that situation and, you know, the stories and how it just, it's really, really moving. I mean, the hair on my arms always stands up without fail um, and the obstacles that they've had and how courageous they all are. Um, it really, really is extraordinary. And it's a big part um, of our ethos and our culture at the company. I mean, it's just, you couldn't get a better mission than seeing a baby or a young child 
um, that's in need. And so we weave that in throughout everything because it gets, um, you know, people's hearts and minds. They really, really care very deeply. It's why they've chosen to do this job oftentimes versus something else. And so we weave it in at all of our um, face-to-face kind of fireside chats, our big meetings. Once a week, I send um, a note to all employees of, uh, called Dose of Inspiration, which was not my name. It was well before I was here. But it kind of helps us catch up about you know, specific patients and what their journey's been and what milestones are they reaching. And um, it's incredibly, incredibly motivational when you get to the end of a very long week and you get to, you know, ingest this and have it be part of, of going into your weekend. Um, it's really, really quite compelling. So we do that just as part of our culture, but then to your point, patient advocacy is such a big part. The learnings that we have, the partnership that we have um, is really, really extraordinary. And I think in, in a lot of ways, very symbiotic because they help us learn and we help them, you know, solve problems as well. Yeah, absolutely. I, was, I moderated a panel at um, WMIF back in May uh, and well, the, the entire conference was absolutely chock full of really good data and information. The, the best and I think most thoughtful and inspirational uh, panel I sat through was the one on patient advocacy. So they had a few different patient advocacy groups represented. I think it might have been Fischler District. Yes. Parent. I mean, it really sort of puts into perspective the work that's being done, you know, by all companies just like Novartis Gene Therapies to make, the, you know, patients' lives better. And and I, yep. I know everybody listening to the podcast is, feels the same way we do, but, you know, when you have the opportunity to listen to people who are living through it, it really, it, it's just, it's incredible. So yeah, yeah, it changes your life. It does. Yeah. Um, well, we've, form- we've reached the end of the formal part of our episode, of the episode. And okay. At the end of each episode though, I like to talk to you again about who they are when they're not in the office of the lab. And so my question for you is, you know, what does a typical weekend look like for you? Like, what do you enjoy doing before you come back to work on Monday morning? And I guess it doesn't have to be a weekend. What do you just enjoy doing when you're off time when you're not at your desk at Novartis Gene Therapies? Yeah, well, I mentioned I have three children. They're all teenagers. So I have twin girls that are 16 and my son's 14 and a husband of 30 years. So we have a very full life outside of my work day. Um, it's like another set of work days, you know, in, in a different way, but also... Oh, sure. Yeah. Filled with such joy. I mean, every age, my husband teases me because he's like, you say it's their, your favorite age of whatever age they're at. I'm like, well, it's true because you kind of experience different things from their eyes, you know? And so they love to cook. I mean, they certainly love to eat. They eat like crazy people um, and they're really involved in sports. So we spend a great deal of our time, you know, either on the soccer pitch or uh, in a volleyball court, just supporting them. And it's, you know, fun certainly to do whatever free time we all have together, they are, they love to work out. So I work out often with them. We just moved back to Chicago um, from California. And so we joined a gym together and that's been a whole different experience, you know, lifting weights with kids that are half your size that can (laughs) whip you into shape. So it's been, you can't really separate those parts of your life versus the work ones. And so it really is a a lovely thing and I'm, you know, super blessed and thankful for it. Good. Good. Yeah. That's uh, it's definitely, they're great ages. I agree with you. You sort of think, uh, you look back fondly on the ages that have passed and the yes. stages that have passed, but you're you know, thankful for the, the current stage that you're in. Um, and yeah, three teenagers in the house. That's, that's interesting too. That's a, yeah. So for anybody that's listening, I, I would suggest if you have any tips or tricks, I'm send me an email or give me some advice because I'm in very uncharted territory. That's for sure. <laughs> that's wonderful. I, I, mine are a little bit younger, but uh, I'm sure, you know, I, I'm sure there are lots of people who, who are living through it or have or, or have come out on the other side. So. Right. Exactly. <laughs> well, that's wonderful. Um, all right, listeners. Well, that wraps up this episode of Cell and Gene, the podcast. Thanks again to my guest, Novartis Gene Therapy's president, Chris Fox. Chris, thank you so much for your time. This was wonderful. My pleasure. Visit Cell and Gene to register for our newsletter and read our timely content in all the formats you prefer to consume our information. We'll talk to you soon.